So the Mazda RX-7 was the car that made the rotary engine cool. And I just felt as a tuning channel, although there's not many people out there with the rotary engines, the Wankel engines that we're particularly talking about in this video, it's certainly worth a discussion. We need to understand all the different types of engine. And the Wankel rotary engine is quite different to any other engine out there. So does that affect our approach to tuning it and upgrading it? What are the best mods and upgrades that you would do to a rotary engine? Well, stay tuned in this video to find out more about this amazing little piece of engineering from Mazda. So in a conventional engine, the pistons go up and down. So as they reverse motion, you lose a lot of kinetic energy. You've got metal things that are moving, stopping, and then coming in the other direction. So if you get something and just shake it, you'll notice there is that inertia there, which creates a lot of extra forces. So with a rotary engine, the combustion chamber is always rotating. There is no reciprocating motion whatsoever that goes on in that. So there's much better videos out there than I would have the technical capabilities to produce to just show how a rotary engine works. So it's certainly worth looking into if you're not familiar with the way the rotary engine works. Typically, you have a chamber inside that rotates. And as it rotates, it goes through the process of intake, compression stroke, there's a spark, a decompression explosive stroke, and that will then go out of the exhaust and the process will repeat. But the engine is just continually spinning in one direction. It's only a 1400cc engine, but they're managing to extract phenomenal amounts of power to this. The engine does seem to rev to infinity. Now, when I drove an RX-7, I was immediately struck with how hard you have to rev it to just pull off the line. In fact, I stalled it the first time I went to pull away. So they seem to be shy on torque at the low end. So before you you start tuning the rotary engines, you need to bear in mind a few little nuances and complexities about the entire car itself. So gearbox issues have been noted by some to be a problem. So when you start pushing up the power, you start to get these issues and problems arising in the transmission. And they typically are around the mountings of the gearbox or the transmission to the car's chassis. So it will typically manifest itself with issues on second to third gear changes, whether you're going to those gears or from those gears. So if you start getting that symptom, it's probably not a major problem. It just requires that the gearbox mounts be addressed and fixed and uprated. Quite a few people have also reported oil problems with leaks appearing, but better O-ring seals and stronger sumps have rectified the problem for most RX-7 owners. So overall, these engines have a bad reputation for reliability. Now, most of that is down to people's misunderstanding of how they should be looked after. So misunderstandings and owner neglect is probably the single biggest contributing factor to the rotary engine. It's very different from a conventional engine. It needs looking after very differently. And really, you need to adapt your driving style to accommodate the nuances and complexities of the rotary engine. So most people ignore this step, but it's quite important. Read the manual. Make sure you understand the engine before you start creating lots of problems for yourself, particularly with regard to starting and stalling the engine, you must be aware of the owner's manual and the recommendations that Mazda are making within that. Otherwise, you are going to run into all sorts of problems. So upping the power on an RX-7 with a rotary engine, you should really start with weight reduction. Weight reduction enables the car to handle better. It improves the braking, the acceleration, and the cornering. And effectively, it's a fairly cheap mod. You're just stripping out heavy items. Replacing body panels with lighter alternatives is certainly a good option. We see carbon fiber parts and fiberglass parts in abundance, really, for the RX-7, and some of them look particularly stylish. There are a few really, really tacky ones out there, but as it's a matter of taste, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether something is worth doing on your car or not. So the turbocharged engines are certainly very interesting when it comes to tuning them. The basic principles apply of getting more air into the engine, which enables you to burn more fuel. And in the event of the rotary engine, you seem to get a lot more out when you start putting these tuning mods in. So uprating the turbo, making sure that the intercooler is up to the job of keeping the engine cool. So turbo upgrades are certainly significant mods that you can do to the RX-7. They dramatically increase the car's ability to suck in fresh air. So larger turbos will certainly help. Bear in mind as well that this engine is much higher revving. There's much more airflow going through it at much greater velocity thanks to those higher RPMs. So you need to choose a turbo profile that is suitable for that type of setup. You will still experience a certain amount of lag at the bottom end, and that may well be 
the sacrifice you make when you start boosting the top end power on these engines. But getting that bigger turbo will make a significant difference to the amount of power that that engine can make. So the intercooler is an important part of the engine design because it cools the intake charge. Now, when it goes through the turbocharger, it picks up a lot of heat and that heat is not good. It carries less oxygen. So you're going to be down on power. So getting an efficient intercooler will make a big difference to the car's ability to deliver the power for prolonged periods of time. So the intercooler itself is not necessarily going to boost power. It's going to stop you losing it more quickly. So even a, a small intercooler will make a difference on the stock setup. But as soon as that intercooler starts to get warm, it becomes less and less effective at cooling down that air charge and you'll start seeing a sap in power. So we would call that heat soak. So that's a problem that's really best avoided just by getting an appropriately designed intercooler. Because these rotary engines do rev to quite high levels, the flywheel is something that can make quite an adjustment to the way that that power is delivered. So going with a slightly lighter flywheel will increase the engine's ability to increase and decrease the RPM. So it will feel much more responsive. And a more responsive engine is always a good thing, whether you're driving in everyday traffic or you're in a track environment. But if you go too light, you are going to start to have other problems with the engine. So there is an optimum there, and it depends on really how you're going to be using the car and how much mods you've done and what your overall power aspirations are for your project. So when it comes to physical mods on the rotary engine, they are very, very different. So you see significant gains usually by porting the apertures that allow the intake charge into the engine and the exhaust charge out of the engine are potentially restrictions there. You're dealing with a lot of air, you've tuned it, it's making a lot more power. So improving the flow in and out of the engine are certainly major considerations of a rotary engine tuning project. Oil supply is critical. The components within the engine, you have the rotors in the engine and the seals around them, they all need to be in good condition. If they start to go, you will start to be burning oil. You're gonna have lubrication issues as that oil starts to burn off and lots of other problems. So it's just vital really that you get those seals and the rotors in good condition for a tuning project before you really start upping the power significantly. The seals, it shouldn't really need to be said, but it does because it's caught out a lot of people. They need to be perfectly mated to a flat surface. If it's not correctly mounted, if it's not mating with a completely flat surface, it's no longer going to be an effective seal. And that's gonna rob you of power and reliability in your engine. So one bodge I've seen done is to use bigger seals to accommodate for this mismatching process. That's crazy, really. You should just install them properly to do it to high tolerances. There's not really, in my book, any excuse for this sloppy approach to engineering and mechanical work on a car, especially one as exotic and precise as the RX-7's rotary. So the RX-7 exhaust, it gets very hot. It's flowing a lot of air. We've actually known the exhausts to grow by quite a substantial size in competition environments, even breaking the mounts where it wasn't mounted appropriately, allow for the exhaust length to actually increase as it starts to heat up. You're dealing with a lot of heat there. So getting a good quality exhaust and one that flows well, a key to the RX-7 project. We often talk about back pressure in a reciprocating piston engine. You certainly, with your rotary engine, want to reduce all of the restrictions in the exhaust as much as possible. You want those gases to be flowing as effectively as possible. There's still a need for scavenging to occur in the cylinders to just ensure that those gases fully empty before the new air charge comes in. But the rotary engine is quite different from a conventional engine. So maybe some of the strategies that we would use tuning a reciprocating piston engine can't be applied to the rotary engine. But looking at the catalyst, that's often where the bottleneck is in the exhaust and particularly the headers that take the exhaust away from the engine. So just making sure that they are flowing as optimally as possible. Replace that cat with a sports cat if it's legal to do so in your area will help you to free up those lost ponies of power that you might otherwise have missed. So we should also talk about intake mods. Getting the air into the engine without a restriction is one of the keys to tuning and optimizing optimizing your rotary engine. So just make sure that you have no restrictions in that intake. We've seen people fit really large cone filters and induction kits. Now, in reality, on most projects, even on the turbo engines, you'll only see about five to 10% of a power boost when you start fitting those items to the engine. So I would normally recommend that investment is saved for when you start to see a restriction in the engine. And instead to 
focus on fueling and turbochargers. So we've spoken about turbochargers, intakes and exhaust. We do need to talk about fueling, getting the fuel into the engine. The injectors, the fuel pump are all critical components in making sure that you get the power out of the engine and it's reaching its optimum. So you will start to see a restriction in the stock factory fuel system on the RX-7 engine. And this will generally manifest itself as flat spots, lack of response and other issues while you're actually driving the car. So I hope this video has been interesting to you. Even if you haven't got a rotary engine, it's interesting to look at the methodology of tuning these rotary engines and it just broadens our automotive knowledge. I've certainly enjoyed researching this topic and I'd really appreciate your comments. What mods have you done to your RX-7? What upgrades would you really rate on these rotary engines? Have I missed something out? Do you disagree with something I've said that was based on research that I've done? So if you do, please fire up the comment. I love learning as much as I can about these engines and you guys that actually own them are the best people to talk to. So thanks for watching. Please boot that like button because that really does help us to get out there. And I've lined this video up for you that you should find really interesting. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in this next video.